Hey everybody, this is George from DinosaurGeorge.com answering the questions I get from around the world. Let's get into it. Santiago from Mexico City says, uh, and that's in Mexico, says, uh, hey, what's up, Dino George? Not much, Santiago, what's up with you? I hope everything's good. He said, I've loved dinosaurs since I was three and I just turned 13. I'm a theropod lover, so I'll tell you, T-Rex is the best. I understand, man. I understand exactly what you mean. He said, so with all these new theropods like Saurophaganax being discovered and the discovery or the idea that Spinosaurus was a fish-eating dinosaur, who was the baddest, nastiest, and most powerful theropod ever? Santiago, that is a very interesting question. Um, I think there's actually a couple of categories. When it comes to baddest, I got to tell you, Utah Raptor is a pretty bad dude. I personally believe he was probably the baddest because... He's got all the weapons he needs. He's got a lot of weight behind him. He's a nasty dude. He has a relatively large brain. So I think uh, Utah Raptor would have been the baddest. As for being the nastiest and most powerful, I think that's a different category. I still believe Tyrannosaurus Rex is the nastiest and most powerful. And the reason why I say that is yes, they're bigger predators. There's Giganotosaurus and Maposaurus and Spinosaurus and perhaps Carcharodontosaurus. These and Saurophaganax and Epanterius, these predators certainly appear to be bigger than Tyrannosaurus rex. But when I talk about power, I'm looking at things like body structure. And to me, it appears to me that Spinosaurus, though bigger, was not uh, nearly as robust and powerful because he probably didn't need to be. I base my opinion on who Tyrannosaurus rex was living with, who he had to kill, and why he is so powerful is because of his skeletal structure. So that's my opinion. People will certainly dis disagree with that, and I respect that, but that's just my opinion. All right, Michael from, I think this is pronounced Manet or Manai, Thunder Bay, Ontario. Hey, Dinosaur George, this is a question I've always wanted to ask. Did grizzly bears live with Arctotus simus, that's the short-faced bear, when he was around? And if so, was it possible that they could have interacted? Yeah, you know what? I believe grizzly bears were around with Arctotus simus. I think they were, Michael. I'm almost sure they were. Um, how they would have interacted, my best guess is they probably would have kept their distance from each other. It's sort of like grizzly bears and black bears today live together, and they've, they've figured out a way to survive sharing an environment, and that is they both kind of have a different sort of food source. Um, black bears are more prone to spending their time looking for berries and roots and that kind of thing. Grizzly bears have a little more meaty diet. They spend more of their time catching fish and killing things like elk and bison and deer and that kind of thing. So they kind of divide up the food source and survive in the same environment. I think grizzlies and Arctotus may have done the same thing. The cool thing about Arctotus is that he seems to be better suited for being out on the open plains, whereas grizzly bears are a little more effective in more densely wooded areas. So my guess is they probably had territories that overlapped one another. If they came in contact with each other, they probably both respectfully gave way because when you have two titans like that, it's unlikely that they're going to just simply burst into fight. They're certainly going to think about what they're doing. And so my best guess is, yeah, they interacted, but they probably kept a distance from each other. Martin from Chicago, Illinois. Hey, DG. Haven't spoken to you in a while. Martin, I haven't heard from you in a while. It's nice to hear you're back again. I was wondering why everyone seems to be using the same head for Delta Dromius when there has never actually been any skull material found. I'm asking this because PaleoFest is coming and Paul Serino's Giants exhibit will be at the Burpee Museum. Well, Martin, that's a very good question. How do you give a head to a dinosaur if you've never found its skull? Well, there are ways they can do it that at least they're using good science to give you a pretty good idea of what the skull looked like. Um, and that is by looking at the configuration of the neck, they can look at similar kinds of dinosaurs and look for distinguishing features that kind of says, you know what, um, Delta Dromius is built sort of like this dinosaur and therefore he probably had a skull similar. That's basically how they do it. If no skull material is found, then certainly there's a lot of guesswork involved. But paleontologists try their best to use as much science available to give you a pretty good idea of who it is. So um, I would say that th the only thing they probably would get wrong would be whether or not Deltadromius had any sort of distinguishing horns or 
spikes or little kotchkas sticking off of his head, that's where it becomes difficult. When you look at dinosaurs like uh, Abelosaurus and Monolophus, I mean Monolophosaurus, Abelosaurus and um, who else? Um, Majungatholus or Majungasaurus. Those dinosaurs are similar, but their skulls are distinctively different because Majungasaurus has a lot more odd spikes and stuff sticking off of his head. Uh, so even though those dinosaurs are similar, there's an example that the skulls can be distinctively different. All right, Zach from Ferrybank, Waterford, Ireland. Hey DG, do you think it's possible that Tyrannosaurus and other large theropods had feathers? Zach, if you would have answered, asked this question, if you would have answered this question, if you would have answered it, you wouldn't be writing to me. If you would have asked this question of me 10 years ago, I would have said no. But since you're not asking me 10 years ago and uh, you're asking me today, then my answer is yes. Yes, I do. I do think that all theropod dinosaurs had feathers in one way or another. Now, they wouldn't have had a full body covering because a Tyrannosaurus, an adult, just does not need any sort of a feathery coat to control its body temperature because its sheer size produced enough heat, in my opinion, to keep it warm, even in the coldest time of winter. Um, but I do believe that they would have had feathers that would have served a purpose to kind of show their maturity level, their place uh, hierarchy in a family. I think the older you were, the more brightly colored and flamboyant your feathers would have been because it would have sent a very clear signal to other members of the group or to strangers who you are and what you're capable of doing. It's sort of nature's way of preventing a fight. We see animals fighting all the time. We think it's great. It's really cool. Heck, Jurassic Fight Club, that's all they did was fight. But in reality, um, fighting is the absolute last thing any large animal wants to do simply because of the possibility of getting injured uh, or even more so being killed. When you're big, you hear the story, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. That's true. When you're big and you fall, you have a very good opportunity to break an arm or a leg and, and um, uh, there's just no way they could generally survive those kind of injuries. So my best guess is, yes, they had feathers, but not for covering, probably for display. Finally, Roy from Spring Springfield, Illinois. Did Saltosaurus have armor or not? And if yes, what would he do with it? To the best of my knowledge, yes, Saltosaurus did have uh, dermal scoots, that is, uh, dermal plates, hardened pieces of bone that were embedded in the skin that acted as uh, chain mail, the way um, uh, knights in shining armor used chain mail. It was a way to deflect a blow, or more importantly, to prevent a sword, or in the case of Saltosaurus, a tooth, from penetrating real deeply into your hide. So yeah, I, I absolutely believe he did, unless some new discovery was found, but uh, I do believe Saltosaurus did, and he had it on his back. And because he had it on his back, that suggests to me that his number one predator was an animal who was taller than he was because he's attacking from the top down. When you see body armor on the back of a neck, that tells you generally that the predator um, is trying to reach the neck and so you have armor to defend it. When you have body armor on your sides, that generally means that your attackers are coming in from the side and are not tall enough to really reach your back. But when you have it on your back, in my opinion, that's a very clear signal that whoever is preying on Saltosaurus, they are attacking his back and therefore he has body armor as a way to defend himself. All right, if you've got a question, go to my website, dinosaurgeorge.com, click on the Ask Dinosaur George page and fill out the form and submit it. I hope you're one of the lucky ones and we answer your questions. Make sure while you're there to sign up to follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, I post a lot of really cool things on Facebook and I'd love to have you as a friend. It's a great way to hear some of the latest stuff that I'm working on. For all of you out there, make sure to use good manners and for you young people, always practice your reading. I will see you guys soon. Today is a nice day outside, so I'm leaving from here and I'm going fossil hunting today. I'll let you know if I find something. See ya.